Welcome to Real Talk with Sarah. I'm your host, Sarah Roberts, and in this episode, we are getting down and dirty. And you can keep your mind in the gutter because that's exactly where we're headed. We are talking garbage and recycling and what the heck happens when we throw things away. We are in the midst of a global garbage crisis, and it can be really easy living in a first world country where our garbage is neatly dealt with every week to believe that the issue isn't as serious as it is. But it is serious. And luckily there are people across the globe working tirelessly at helping to create solutions that will help. But if we truly want to see change, we all need to play our part in cleaning up the mess. To help us understand the issue better, I've asked Duncan Barry from Waste Watch Ottawa to give us an overview of the problem and help us understand where we're doing things well and where we need to improve. Then we'll hear from Nicole hoover Bienach from the City of Ottawa, who will demystify the blue box, green bin and black bin so we know what we are supposed to be doing. And later, we'll have Nita Tandon, founder of Dalsini Stainless, on the show, sharing her innovative storage products and getting her thoughts on the impact plastics have on our health. It's a jam-packed hour, so let's do this. Episode 20 of Real Talk with Sarah starts right now. We hear about the great garbage patch and barges of our garbage floating around the ocean that no one wants to take responsibility for, and we are appalled. But we can forget about our contribution to the problem. We simply roll out our bins on garbage day and go on with our lives. But what happens once it's out of sight and out of mind? Well, I've got waste expert Duncan Barry with me to help us understand what's really going on with our garbage so that we can begin to make important shifts designed to help us improve the health of our planet. Welcome, Duncan. My pleasure. Thank you so much for being here to really help us unpack this huge issue that yep. more and more of us are talking about. It's becoming yep. more top of mind. It's in the news more. Yep. What is going on on a global scale with garbage? In, in Canada, every Canadian produces about 850 kilos of garbage per person per year, so close to a ton. Only the Americans produce more than we do, and they do 950. Wow. Um, the Swedes, on the other hand, it's more like 580. So in Canada, we have a, an issue with how much we generate. We have an issue with how, we, how much we consume. Um, in terms of how it's managed, it, it does depend. It, it sort of appears to disappear, right? Yes. And as you mentioned, you, yeah. you put your garbage on the curb, and it goes away somewhere. Just gone, well, and course, everything. It doesn't go away somewhere. No. It has to go somewhere. Yeah. Um, we've been recycling in aggregate across the country about 25% of that 30 some million tons that we generate. So, Canadians, 35 million, is about 30 million tons of garbage generated a year. We only recycle about 25% of that. Um, so, the other 75% is being disposed of, small amount being incinerated, most of it going to landfill. And, and of the stuff that's going to landfill, yes. how much of what's in the landfill? could have been recycled for... for Considerably more, okay. and, that, and that's the challenge. So um, when you look at what's happening municipally, um, there are municipalities which are recycling up to 65% of what, of what they're, they're collecting r residentially. Ottawa is about 44%, so we've got some ways to go in Ottawa behind what the leading municipalities are doing. Um, but we could certainly do an awful lot, an awful lot better. Even if we got to 50% as a standard across the country, that would make a huge, huge impact. Um, one of the challenges is there's not a lot or as much happening on the commercial side of things. So the, the waste that's generated from businesses, offices, factories, um, institutions, big hospitals, that kind of thing. There's there's less going on in that in that regard, and that's one of the one of the one of the things that we need to focus much much more attention on. One of the realities about sort of affluence, I think, in Canada, of course, being a, a good example of that, is that we we're wealthy. We buy a lot of stuff, and actually, if you look at the developing world, the countries which are in fact moving up in terms of um, their wealth, their life expectancy, their standard of living, they, they start producing more garbage. You know, mm -hmm. they're nowhere near where we are in North America, yeah. but you know, this is one of the problems. So, mm -hmm. um, we need to change some of the thinking on, on, on this, and this is where this idea of producer responsibility comes in. So, we don't. We don't want this kind of package. This is a 
polystyrene, styrofoam. You know, this is a this is a piece of, of garbage. It's not recyclable. Now, what's the symbol on the top of that? Well, container? It's, it, it has a it has a, 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 a triangle symbol on it, which yeah. most people think means it's recyclable. Yes. But that's not the case. It just simply identifies what type of plastic it is. So this is a this is a misconception. And um, you know, if you gave Unilever, Canadian Tire, Procter and Gamble, Nestle some direct responsibility for looking after this, maybe they decide this is expensive to recycle because it is. It's lightweight. You have to have an awful lot of it before you can actually, um, you know, recycle it in any kind of efficient way. That maybe they then think that we, we shouldn't be producing this. And some of the big leading companies, Walmart, for example, has said by 2021, we're not going to package anything in polystyrene. Excellent. So it's a major, major thing. So, um, so things are shifting. They are things changing. are starting to happen. Yeah. Some of the big corporate leaders have committed to, you know, plastics reduction and uh, some uh, some global kind of goals and standards which have been set. In Canada, what's happening is there's a move towards producer responsibility for packaging recycling. And so in British Columbia, the industries, the kind of companies I mentioned, anybody who puts a package onto the marketplace or puts a product on the marketplace, they are, they are legally obligated to fund the recycling program and operate it. So municipalities are basically out of the game in British Columbia unless they choose to contract back to the industry, which some do. Um, and that's being discussed now in Ontario. So there's a move to, to set up a British Columbia type system in Ontario. Right now, municipalities operate the programs right. and they get close to 50% of the funding from these same industries, but they don't, you know, industry doesn't really run it. They're not responsible. They have no direct incentive to get rid of polystyrene. So, so that's they set where up the this infrastructure, the, the bins and, and the... All the municipal responsibility. So, you know, they're responsible for the marketing. And this is where this issue of marketing plastics, which people have probably heard about. And this is where, you know, China said a couple of years ago, we don't want your garbage any longer. We don't want your poor quality recyclable materials. Yes. And they, they, they closed the door, which has caused reverberations through not just Canada, but the U.S., and Europe and, and elsewhere. So that um, what's starting to happen is we're starting to think, well, maybe we need to develop some of this recycling capacity domestically. Instead of shipping these poorer quality recyclable materials overseas, yeah. we should manage this better here. So yeah. we need to do a better quality control at the curb and where this is collected, but we also need to have the capacity in the market to we'll do this. We'll talk about out of sight, out of mind. If we're shipping <clears throat> it off to China yes. and, other, and overseas. Yes. yes. The other problem is we're actually shipping a lot of regular garbage, not the recyclable side, to, to the U.S. So Ontario ships large amounts of garbage, like up to 40 percent of what's generated out of the 12 million tons in Ontario goes to New York State and to Michigan. And that's, in the long run, not a sustainable thing either. We, we cannot. I mean, it's workable now because it's cheap, so, you know, commercial uh, It's operate. cheaper for us to send Correct. our garbage <clears throat> to that's the right. States. Tipping fees and the arrangements these companies are made with host municipalities in New York and Michigan are financially attractive, so that's where it goes. Mm -hmm. If all that garbage had to ret be managed in Ontario, we'd have a major crisis on our hand very, very quickly, frankly. Um, so we've got some problems, so we need to increase our recycling. People need to do what they can individually by trying to avoid this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, buying, here's a, re a refillable milk bottle. Yeah. You know, I mean, place like Farm Boy, you can buy refillable. This is a glass bottle. I mean, it has a deposit on it. When I take this back, I'll get two dollars back. Yes. Um, what a beautiful to, incentive, you know, locally absolutely. right here with a great company. One of the other ideas is is this idea of, of user pay. Ah, so this is where, instead of getting your garbage just sort of picked up as part of your regular kind of property tax that you pay, and, it, and there's no direct financial transaction. And many, many municipalities in Ontario, you have to pay. <clears throat> you may get one bag you can put out that you don't have to pay, but anything over that you have to pay. So this is a tag from municipality on Lake Huron. Um, this, is, this is worth $3. So if you want to put an extra bag out in, in the, the town of South Bruce Peninsula, you have to put a $3 tag on it. And be amazed what this does. It means people think 
gosh, $3 doesn't sound like a lot, but it makes people think, I don't have to pay $3 if I put it into the recycle bin or I put it into the organics green bin. Or I reduce my consumption. Or I reduce overall. Yes. Absolutely. Brilliant. Absolutely. It makes so, me think of air airports making us pay for that extra piece of luggage. Well, exactly. It's very yeah. similar. So a simple little incentive. Mm -hmm. um, it works on deposits. I mean, this is the, the, the key thing here. I mean, totally. everybody knows about beer deposits, but in, in most parts of Canada, there's actually deposits on all sorts of soft drinks and other beverages. Ontario doesn't have that. Um, it better deposit on liquor bottles but you know there are all sorts of beverages you know including water and in, in many other parts of the country where there's a deposit and so even if it's only five cents or ten cents these containers get back into the system to be reprocessed and remanufactured and recycled so simple financial incentives um, like a user pay system or deposits are the kind of direction we need to go produce responsibility People need to go to Walmart and say, yes, I don't want you to put it in, in polystyrene. Um, Metro Groceries, I think, just announced they're going to get out of plastic bags. You know, we'll only, only use, you know, re reusable bags. I've, I've had, I hate to think how old this is. It's starting <laughs> to come apart, but, you know, it needs to be re-sown, but I've had this for years. So, you know, simple things like that, telling companies that we want you to do this. Metro, I think I heard somebody interviewed and they said, we're doing this because our, our customers want it. They don't want plastic bags that get thrown away. Mm -hmm. they, they're quite happy if we make this, this decision. So, so it's all good. We're starting to really see the shifts. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think that it's, it's, it's important for us to know that we've diverted so much garbage that we can, again, have that blind faith that, oh, it's just taken care yes. of and everything's okay. Yes. People need to take some responsibility themselves, yeah. you know, in terms of using their recycling programs, which yeah. have been well established, been around for over 30 years. So, you know, lots of lots of experience there. Or, or the green bin program, we need to increase participation in that for that's sure. That's the composting. That's the composting program because yeah. that's not working as well as it should. Not just in Ottawa, but some other places as well. Um, but we need to basically tell companies you should be responsible for this. I mean, we can't make the decision. I mean, whoever packaged this, that wasn't a, a decision you and I made. This was the decision that the company that produced this and packaged what I can't remember what was in this. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they made that decision, so they need to be obliged. And if they figure it's expensive to recycle polystyrene because it's lightweight, it's hard to, 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 to ship, it's expensive to transport and process, then maybe they decide we don't put it in that. We put it into something which is recyclable, like a, like a, a, a recyclable plastic, right? like a PET container, like, like a soft drink you know, bottle, for example. I really think this is an important piece that it's really putting the responsibility in the hands of the people who yes. can make the, the decision. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And this idea of producer responsibility has been around a long time. So mm -hmm. the first programs of this kind were in Germany in 1991, counted for packaging. Um, British Columbia did a, a program like this for paint. So any waste paint, you know, the producer was made legally obligated to look after those waste paint containers in 1994. Wow. Um, and so, you know, there are lots of programs, electronics, you know, tires, batteries. This idea is an old one. We have lots of these programs, but we haven't really cracked the nut on packaging yet. So uh, that's where we need to work much better. Thank you so much for being here, Duncan. I wish we could keep talking, but we can't. Okay. After the break, I'll have Nicole hoover Benash with me. Back in a moment. Thank you. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're talking about garbage and recycling and reducing our carbon footprint on this show. And I've got Nicole hoover Benash from the City of Ottawa with me to go deeper into the topic. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. I know I'm pronouncing your last name totally wrong. <laughs> That's okay. Bienash. Bienash. But, okay. <laughs> kind of It's close. a tricky one. Not long ago, I was, a couple of years ago now, mm -hmm. I was visiting Fredericton and I emptied a pickle jar mm -hmm. and I said, oh, so where do, you where do we recycle the glass? And it was, no, you just put that in the garbage. And I couldn't believe that the way that they recycle in New Brunswick is completely different than the way that we recycle here in Ontario. Absolutely. And so it just started getting my mind thinking about this topic. And I'm yeah. so happy that you're here to help us kind of understand how does the whole recycling thing work? 
Like, how is it so different in different municipalities? So that, that's interesting because you're right. Every single province, every municipality is very different in, in how they manage their waste and, you know, coming down to certain policies and programs that they offer as well. Um, so in the example of the pickle jar, one of the challenging things is there's very limited market value at the end of the day for glass. The city of Ottawa, we accept it within our program because we've actually found a way that we reuse it. So with the city of Ottawa, we actually own an operator on landfill, so we're able to break down some of that glass and we actually use it in um, building roadways um, within our landfill. Wow. So, but that gets back to the topic of how is it that recycling works? Yeah. So in, I guess the most simple way to, to explain it would be, um, we're placing all those items into our recycling bin at the end of the day. The city of, or sorry, your municipality um, is taking it away. Um, in our case, the city of Ottawa, we contract out that service um, to a um, recycling facility that through a number of different um, technologies that they use, but also very manual process as well. So when we separate, put, when we put our recycling yeah. on the side of the road here in Ottawa, yes. I think we think that it's the city of Ottawa coming by to pick up our recycling bins. So it is. In our case, it it's the city of Ottawa. Yep. We do have we have a mix of in-house as well as external contractors that we use to actually to operate the system and to pick up the waste. Yep. But then we also contract with processors. Um, and all municipalities, again, are different. Some of them own and operate their own processing facilities. In our case, we contract that out. But I think the, point, the, the, the really amazing thing yeah. that I don't think everybody realizes is that recycling is a business. Yes. And I don't think people realize that yes. it's a business. And the reason why the pickle jar didn't fly in, in Fredericton, there's no market. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, once those products um, are physically separated, so glass and certain types of pro um, sorry, plastics, what they do is they're bailed up and essentially we sell them to an end market and really it, it goes to the highest bidder. So um, the end market, again, it's a commodity market. So you're subject to supply and demand as well. So that's where you will see that price fluctuation. And as Duncan, your earlier guest mentioned, he was talking about um, the China sword and, you know, the fact that they've essentially cut essentially stopped accepting um, recyclable material from North America, that's a huge impact uh, to our market. The beautiful thing is the city of Ottawa, um, we've been very successful in marketing our products solely to um, North American markets and local markets. And one of the reasons why is the fact that um, in Ottawa, we do separate our fiber, so in our paper, from our recyclables, um, so our glass metals and our plastics, resulting in lower contamination rates. So we have a cleaner product at the end of the day, okay. which is more marketable. Right. Right. So that just makes sense when we think about it from, yep. in, from in terms of business. Yes. We, so contamination, to me, I think of peanut butter left in the, con, you know, in the container, that's contaminating the bin. You're saying paper is mixed with glass, mixed with plastic, that's kind of the contamination. Absolutely. Yeah. But the example that you did give, I mean, if you're throwing half a, half a jar of peanut butter, that is considered contamination because that will ultimately be, have to end up going to landfill. Um, but contamination also is when you're getting those glass shards into, into paper. Um, it's very difficult to actually reuse that. Soiled as well. Um, it, you know, an unsoiled pizza box, so nothing with pizza grease on it, can easily be recycled. But as soon as you introduce that grease onto it, that's something that you know, goes into the green bin. And what pizza box doesn't have grease or leftover cheese <laughs> exactly. or a few crusts that we exactly. throw in there, right? Yep. So we're looking for we that clean, you know, box board material yes. in order to, again, be the most marketable material at the end of the day. So what do we need to know as a community? What do we need to know to do a better job of not, I'd like to keep going on this contamination thing. Yep. I want to know how much do I need to clean out my peanut butter container before throwing it in the recycling bin? Yep my yogurt container yep. like what do we need to know and it, it's a great question i mean in an ideal world you are rinsing out those products like those um to make sure that you're getting ready rid of the peanut butter residue or the yogurt residue um at the it's making sure that you're at the end of the day where so later on throughout the process, they are actually cleaning some of these materials as well. Um, so, but the fact that if you're leaving the actual product, like a fair amount of the product in it, that is contaminating it. But you can definitely, most ideally, you are rinsing it. One of the tips and tricks that um, we give um, residents is when you're washing your dishes and you already have some of that gray water existing, just rinse it out with that gray water okay. instead of using fresh running water and wasting water as well. So we're cleaning out our containers yes. and then we're putting them into the proper bin. Yep. 
and then walk us through sort of what happens. So we, we away goes the recycling, yep. and then it gets taken to a plant, and then it's sorted again? Absolutely. So okay. there's a number of different very, it's fascinating to see, but um, it, very interesting um, mechanical um, tools that they use to be able to separate, you know, magnets that are used to pick up some of the, like the more metal-based products. Um, they actually, this, certain things will go to, depending on the weight, will be, um, will be uh, distributed or sorted that way. But there's also a very manual intensive process as well. Um, so that at the end of the line, they're making sure that everything's properly sorted. From there, it's, it's essentially bailed. So it's, um, so if you think of the plastic containers, they're essentially compressed, they're shipped or bundled into one large bale, and then they're shipped off. They're sold to that, that end market user, who will then break it down. So there's, there's different mechanisms for breaking down all the different products. So for example, certain plastics can be um, broken down into um, plastic pellets that can then be melted and reused in different different products. Um, so for example, um, and when we look at fibers, you know, newspapers can be, um, and magazines can be broken down and recreated into um, egg cartons. Um, you can use old plastic water bottles that are used to recreate plastic egg cartons, flower pots. So that kind of gives you a sense of the how essentially that works. Yeah, and mm -hmm. how it turns into other yes. products. Yep. I think that's what's so cool is that mm -hmm. We're seeing all of these recycled products. We're, we're wanting to purchase those things. Yeah. But let's also talk about reducing in the first place. Yes. I mean, we, it's great when we're able to recycle, but you know, we learned from Duncan, not all of it gets recycled. Absolutely. We wish it would be. So I think when, when we grew up, we were probably very familiar with the terms of the waste hierarchy of the three R's. So reduce, reuse, recycle. So now within the industry, it's become the norm where we're actually focusing, we now have five R's. So focusing, again, on re Reduce, reuse, recycle, recovery, and then your residual disposal, which is your, your last resort, which is to whatever cannot be dealt with through the earlier um, portions of the hierarchy is it's going to landfill or incineration. And I think when we talk about the hierarchy, mm -hmm. really important to remember yep. what hierarchy means. Yes. Reduce. Reduce, exactly. So starting with that, mm -hmm. and it can be from first and foremost, um, just avoiding certain things. We've... Um, you know, we have um, unprecedented amounts of wealth within our economy. We're a very consumer-based economy. Uh, we have huge reliance on single-use products in general um, nowadays because of feeding into that whole notion of convenience. Um, so it's really, it goes back to the consumer and you have that power and you have that opportunity to make that choice to reduce your consumption. Um, so whether it's reducing your reliance on those single-use products and, um, and using reusable bags when you're going grocery shopping. Yeah. So there's simple things that you can do within your own household. Um, actually investing a little bit more in higher quality products. Um, we've seen with the global uh, globalization, we now have you know access to um, products that are manufactured at a much cheaper rate, so therefore as consumers, products are much cheaper. Um, but oftentimes the quality is not as good. So um, just kind of reframing and refocusing and, and taking that opportunity to invest perhaps a little bit more in a better quality product, but also repairing. So we know too, a lot of people, um, tends to be gone are the days that you know you'd pull out your sewing machine and you know personally repair your items but instead of you know thinking that that twenty dollar t-shirt we can just throw it away in the garbage it's thinking twice and actually taking the opportunity to repair I love that. Mm -hmm. I think that we really do need to just get into that mindset. Yep. Thrifting, you know, yes. like especially people that are between sizes. I often yep. mention that's a great strategy, but for anybody yep. to be thrifting and to be just reusing things, looking Absolutely. for yeah, different purchasing second hand instead of automatically going to something new. Um, and then getting into, there's so many people out there who love, you know, you have your Instagram trends of upcycling different products too. So there are people out there who can do, who are very crafty and very talented, not myself, but <laughs> who can recreate, um, you know, great things out of some, somebody's old things. So um, within Ottawa, I mean, take a look at the opportunity to resell items instead of um, throwing them in the in the garbage. So in Ottawa, we have a number of different Facebook groups, So, um, which is amazing, you know, that grassroots community led where um, neighbors are offering items up to other neighbors um, to pick up if they no longer want it. So finding a new home for that. Number of different local websites that you can consider, all of the tools and resources available on our website, ottawa.ca um, but it's 
lending tools to your neighbors as well instead of having to go out and purchase tools that you only use so often. Um, so th those Love are some it. great opportunities to reuse. Definitely. Yeah. All right. When we come back, Nicole's going to break it all down for us as far as what bins that we're supposed to be using so we can recycle properly. Back in a moment. Welcome back to Real Talk with Sarah. If you're just joining us, we're talking about waste and recycling on this show. And I have Nicole Hoover Bianash from the city of Ottawa helping us understand how to properly use each of the bins. Oh Perfect. my gosh, tell us what we are doing right, what we're doing wrong, what is supposed to go in, what is not supposed to go in. <laughs> What happens, let's start with the blue bin. Start with the blue bin. Yeah. So very simple way is glass, metals, plastics. Glass, metal, plastic, okay. okay. Um, so when you think of some of the typical products that you have around the household, so empty bleach containers, laundry detergent can go in there. One of the things that actually residents are tend to end up in the garbage versus the blue bin is all your hair care products. So the empty containers from your shampoos. Um, and a lot of that is just because it's not convenient when you're, you're in the upstairs of your house, for example, and, mm -hmm. and finding the opportunity to bring that down into your recycling bin. So that's one area where yeah, residents can do a better job. Let's do a better job. And so rinsing that out. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. Um, our milk containers um, and also, um, you know, your, your soup broth containers that are the, the similar um, um, quality okay. or type of material, sorry, that go in. So glass, metal, plastic, mm -hmm. but we're seeing what some people would consider as a paper product going in the blue bin. Yes. I think a lot of people think that's paper. This goes into the blue bin. Okay. Yep. Okay. So then we have aerosol cans, so empty aerosol cans. So your, your hairspray, um, your, in this case, static guard, this goes into the blue bin, okay. but making sure that it is empty. I don't think a lot of people think that aerosols go in the blue bin. So this case will go in the blue bin. Okay. Yep. Now, granted, the one thing to keep in mind, so your, your poisonous or any of your hazardous materials, that's considered hazardous waste. In the city of Ottawa, we host a number of ha oh, household hazardous waste depots throughout the year. So it's making sure that anything poisonous, flammable, um, or again, or poisonous, that that is brought back through those. So we're looking depots. through those symbols exactly. on those products and we're taking those appropriately. So we're checking with our municipality for Absolutely. when those days happen. Exactly. Okay. And as you mentioned, every municipality is different how yeah. they've structured their program. So take a look at their website is the best okay. option. Um, another thing oftentimes people don't think of is tinfoil. Um, and in this case, some of these, you know, they're single use, but uh, tinfoil trays. These go in the blue, blue bin. Okay. Uh, and we actually get a lot of, it's uh, quite good value from aluminum. Really? Aluminum foil, absolutely. Okay. Um, aluminum foil, and one of the misconceptions is that it has to be clean. It doesn't necessarily have to be clean. It can be soiled in order for you to put it in here So too. just kind of folding it up or crumpling it and then putting it in. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Your plastic clamshells. With the little label on yep. there? The stickers are okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. I think some people are spending time googoning and getting yep. rid of. And we don't need to do <laughs> That's that. That's dedication, yes. but no, no need to do that. Okay. One other thing too that I find differs from municipalities is if you're using plastic, um, single-use plastic bottles. Certain municipalities ask you to take the cap off. We actually keep the cap on. It's just easier because the actual caps they won't be picked up um, within the recycling processing line. Okay. Mm -hmm. And some places you can crumple the plastic yep. down. And and some you can. So you can do that here, same sort of thing with aluminum cans, we will accept it that way as well. Okay. Um, you know, our yogurt containers, um, we talked about. What about the flimsy packaging on the top of the yogurt container that we've peeled off? That is garbage. That is garbage. Yep. Got it. It's a good question. Okay. Um, aluminum cans, same sort of thing, and again, you can crush these down. Um, we have some plastic here. We have our glass bottles. Um, one other thing you'll notice. Glass bottles with the metal lid? Yep. So the whole thing goes in? Yep. Uh, ideally separate them. Take the lid off. Okay. Um, it's much easier, yeah, for, for the so actual processing. So we're rinsing out the glass lid, we're yep. taking it off, and both go in the blue bin. Absolutely. Okay. And then you have one other thing that differs between municipalities, black plastic. Um, so for example, the City of Toronto does not, uh, but we do uh, accept black, black plastic. And we're um, calling it black plastic black because plastic. it is black plastic Absolutely. in all cases. Yes. Whether or not it's shiny like this, I've yep. seen the dull down. Yep. 
all of that is considered black plastic. Absolutely. Where does it go? So this goes in the blue bin in as well. In the blue bin, okay. Another thing, our liquor bottle, both our bottles and our aluminum cans, so we do not accept that in the city's program. These are all taken back to your local beer store but in the province of Ontario. What happens in the province of Ontario yes. if you put that in your blue bin? We will accept it. Okay. We will still accept it even though the fact, and I think Duncan had mentioned this earlier, we, you do pay a deposit on that, yeah. so that's your opportunity to get your deposit back is through that system. So I'm, I'm just wondering, are there mm -hmm. not people that if that ends up in a blue bin, are there people at the depot that are taking out anything that is worth money and is there any of that happening? That, that should not be happening, okay. but no, they do have a number of controls in place to prevent any of that from happening, but this would be the same sort of thing. We would we would actually see, get the revenue from this product. Okay. okay. That's what I was kind of hoping that it yep. was a good thing. That exactly. If they do end so up in there. So if it ends up in there, not a problem, okay. but again, if you want your deposit back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We've painted this blue bin black. Yes. <laughs> For our purposes on TV, but this is a black bin. Yes. What is a black bin? I don't have a black bin. I live in a condo building. Oh, we really? Don't. You we guys, do have a black bin, so, but it's for paper. But it's a different color. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Like your larger bins. Okay. Um, but this is for, um, you would think, uh, paper and fiber okay. primarily. Yeah. So again, it's your, your box board material that'll go in. When you're thinking of cereal boxes, make sure to take that liner out. The liner itself is garbage. The liner is garbage. The paper is good. And we would crush this down just to Ex save space. Exactly. Okay. Um, you know, your toilet paper rolls, that's often one thing too. Again, in the washroom, people tend to throw it right into the garbage, but that goes right into to your, your black bin. Um, again, any kind of box material. Your egg cartons can go into the black bin. Newspaper, um, paper, thinking of your, your open mail, any of your flyers, all of that stuff can go into the, the black bin. Okay. Paper bags. Excellent. All into the black bin. And then, of course, newspapers, ma magazines. What magazines. About? Black bin as well. Magazines. Um, old books, soft and hardcover as well. So if you've, ideally, you want to give them away yes. and give it an opportunity for a new life. But if not, that goes into your black bin as well. All right. Let's move on to the... Re the composting. Composting, it's yes. such a confusing topic for a lot of people, I think. And this is where we have the biggest opportunity to improve. Okay. Um, actually, if you were to take a look at your garbage in total, at least when it comes to Ottawa's perspective, you have up to 75% of waste can be diverted. So really only 25% of it should be making its way into the garbage. Oh my gosh, 75% of the garbage that we, pr the, the produce. waste that we produce. Yep should be done this way. In these three. And not be sitting in a landfill Absolutely. creating greenhouse gases. Yes. Okay. Biggest opportunity to improve is on the green bin. Okay. Um, so we still have just about 40% of what makes up garbage, and this is um, calculated through our waste audits, is green bin material still make its way into the garbage. We only have about 52% of Ottawans that are participating in the green bin program. And it's not just Ottawa. We have a lot of opportunity to improve, but this tends to be also um, nationally and internationally. You're seeing that lagging when it comes to organic Why are diversion. we reluctant to having compost bins and dealing with it? Great question. We actually recently undertook some market research. Um, biggest thing, residents say, is the yuck factor. The yuck factor. They find it yep. disgusting to yep. clean, but there's simple, easy ways for you to keep it clean. Um, Tell us what those are. So <laughs> one of these, the beauty, these yeah. um, these paper plagues, and they actually have a little bit of a, a liner on it that will fully biodegrade. Where it's, do we get these? So you can get these, you have them at your Costco, a number of your local grocery stores, uh, Canadian Tire, so local retailers. And where do we get these bins? You can just call the City of Ottawa. Okay. So if you need a new one, yours is broken, um, and you can either call the City of Ottawa at 311, visit our website, ottawa.ca, and you can just fill out a quick little form, and we'll have it delivered directly to your household. Amazing. So then you yep. just have to be responsible to pick up these bags. Absolutely. What goes in the composting So bin? typically any leftover food waste. Um, so here I've got a lovely assortment of you. You have broccoli, banana peels, eggshells, um, you know, your onion peels, apple peels, your apple core. So any of that food waste, you're cleaning out your fridge. Um, for example, you're cleaning out those peanut butter jars or the jar of jam that has expired and it's gone bad. All of that waste that you're, you know, taking out of those jars containers into your green bin. Okay. okay. Uh, some things that people don't often think about, you know, your paper napkins, paper towels if you're using them as well. All of this into the green bin. Because that wouldn't go in paper. Correct. That would not go in the black bin. Exactly. Okay. So meat packaging. Um, you're paper based. Another thing to think of is, you know, you have the ice cream containers. So this can actually, this will biodegrade. So really? you can pop that, absolutely. Is it not coated with some type of plastic or? So it's, it's a wax based. Okay. Yep. Wax paper as well. So that, we have some parchment paper. 
some of the typical things you wouldn't normally think of, um, your dryer lint, um, any of the, um, I guess it would be rubbish coming from your vacuum cleaner, that can all go into the green bin, pet fur, kitty litter, and dog waste is oh all gosh. accepted in the green bin as well. Like poop? Yep. Dog poop? poop? Dog poop. What, and kitty poop we wouldn't because... And your do. litter. Yep, absolutely. So dirty litter. Yep, dirty litter. Your birds, you have oh gosh, birds. any I kind of animal. so much today. <laughs> your pet bedding can all go into the green bin as well. So as you can see. Like guinea pig, that kind, exactly. of, that kind of bedding. Yep. Okay. Hamster bedding. I'm loving this to just yep. keep it so that we can watch how little waste we need to actually throw in a garbage. Absolutely. So let's talk about garbage. I'll so switch the, spots with you. Sounds good. So when you're getting into the actual garbage, as you can see, this is kind of representative too. Again, 25% of what we have should be make its way into the garbage. Yeah. Candy wrappers. Where can that be recycled? So Nowhere. it cannot be. Nowhere. So this is something that would end up in the garbage and this is actually oftentimes we'll see um, plastic bags, um, wrappers from uh, cases of water bottles. A lot of that ends up in the blue bin. It should not be going in the blue bin. Okay. That needs to make its way into the garbage. Um, I think Duncan had mentioned this earlier too. Um, your styrofoam, that is garbage. It's not recyclable. Any of your plastic bags, plastic straws, all of that makes its way into the garbage. Oh my gosh. It's honestly showing me so many opportunities where we can improve. Yes. But also showing me that, you know, I think a lot of people know what's going on with a lot of these things. So yep. I think a lot of people are trying. Yes. And it just takes this little bit of raised awareness to just help us all to just do a little bit better. Yes. Where do you think is the one place? We got 30 seconds. Where can we improve the most? So the biggest thing is going back to it's your organics. organics. So really taking the effort, it doesn't take very much to participate mm. and really it's, it's just shifting that behavior, right. making it simple for yourself, replace your garbage bin with a green bin and I swear you would be shocked and surprised at to how little you actually use your garbage bin. Amazing, this is awesome. I'm so happy that everybody is learning alongside with me. When we come back, I'll have Nita Tandon with Dalsini Stainless sharing about plastics and our health. Back in a moment. Amazing. If you're just joining us, we're talking about garbage and recycling and the connection between our behavior and the health of the planet. I'm delighted to have Nita Tandon, founder of Dalsini Stainless with me, to share why she felt compelled to create her company. Welcome, Nita. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy you're here. We've known each other a while now. Mm -hmm. I've watched a bit of the growth of your company. It's been incredible to watch. Let's go back a little bit. You used to be in the pharmaceutical industry. Right. And you became pregnant with your daughter. Right. And you started learning about the relationship between plastics and the endocrine system, the, the way that right. they disrupt our hormones. Take it away. Well, I started when I started looking at a lot of the journals. So my job um, very much was in the pharmaceutical industry, but in my spare time, I used to love reading all of the uh, medical journals. And the thing that kept crossing my desk was all this information about BPA. Yeah. At the time, I wasn't pregnant. I didn't have a child. There was nothing. It was just the BPA. And uh, in 2009, Health Canada banned BPA in baby bottles. But they didn't ban it in anything else. And so when I had my daughter, I think any family will basically look at the amount of plastic that it just fills your home when you have a child. And I thought... Like the toys, the everything. diapers, the, yeah. the... The plastic baby bottles, the toys, the soothers, the everything. Yeah. And so I just said, I don't want that much plastic, but what's my alternative? And I knew glass was not uh, an ideal scenario for young kids. And so when I looked around, I even looked at some of the stainless steel that was on the market, and some of the stainless steel also had BPA on it on the inside. So for me, it was very much to start um, a healthy product and at the same time have one that was going to be sustainable. Now, all, a lot of it started because I had a cup from when I was a child and used it for 40 years. Like a cup like this? Like this. Okay. So I didn't grow up using a plastic cup. Okay. Or glass? No. It was a stainless steel cup. And so if I had this for 40 years, why could, couldn't I create other things with stainless steel that would last, that would not contain the chemicals, that could be washed, rewashed a number of times, and that is infinitely recyclable? So with paper and plastic, there's a certain number of times you can recycle. With um, stainless steel, it's infinitely recyclable. I think that's really interesting and something that we didn't really talk about with Duncan or with uh, Nicole, that 
there is an end of days for mm -hmm. plastics. Right. They can't just keep being recycled over and over. I think a lot of us think right. they can be. Right. How does that happen that they finally end up not being able, how is that determined? Do you know that? Well, every time you recycle, it, um, it, it sort of weakens the fibers. Sure. And so it, every product, um, there's another use for it, but eventually there's no more use for it yeah. because it's degraded so much. Mm -hmm. um, and so with stainless steel, it's, and similar to aluminum and similar to glass, it's, if there's someone that wants to use it, it can be recycled infinite number of times. So what was the first product that you decided to make? Was it the cup? It wasn't the cup, actually. It was lunch containers. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I looked at was when I'm going to the park, when I'm, um, you know, when she started going to school, when I was looking at storing food, the first thing I thought was, why are we storing food in plastic? Because plastic degrades with heat. And it also starts uh, leaching chemicals. So that's really where the impetus was to change. Because of the chemicals that you learned right. were then, so not just BPA, all of the chemicals that are in, pl I mean, chem plastic is chemicals, right? right. So yeah. plastic is chemicals, yeah. but the, the BPA is the one that really started resonating with people. And so what happened was in Health Canada banned BPA, um, a lot of manufacturers started saying, oh, BPA's got such a bad name, we better pull it out. And so they made BPA-free plastic. And what they did was they replaced BPA, which is bisphenol A, with bisphenol S and bisphenol F. And so really, it's still a bisphenol. It's the same class, and it's doing the same damage. Um, so, so we're going around with this false confidence we are. that we are purchasing products that are in BPA-free plastic, right? but they have BPS or BPF right. doing the same damage to our endocrine right. system. I, I do want to wow. also say that not all plastics contain endocrine disruptors. Okay. So not all of them, but there are chemicals in plastic and we don't need to be ingesting them. There was a time before plastic was around our food and I think we do need to start looking at cultures that were without plastic. How did they do it and what can we learn from them mm -hmm. and start implementing that in our society? What can we do? What do you think are the best first steps for somebody? So for, from a health perspective, the first thing I would look at is uh, we should stop consuming plastic. And what I mean by that is when um, when we pick up, say, margarine uh, in a plastic tub, we bring it home, the issue isn't then. The issue is when we're reusing that plastic that wasn't meant to be reused because they're generally using uh, margarine tubs as packaging, mm -hmm. not as a reusable container. Or those tall yogurt containers or right. whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so first thing was, first thing is to use packaging as packaging and, and recycle it. The other is when you have the opportunity to buy glass, do. So if tomato sauce comes in glass jars versus the can, buy the glass. Um, if you're looking at, um, there's a number of products now that you can buy plastic free or package free do that. But in the kitchen, I would look at things like um, your cutting board. Uh, go without the plastic. Go to wood cutting boards. Because every time you're putting us, you know, you're cutting things, those are little tiny bits of plastic that we then ingest. Mm -hmm. And every time we're washing, we are um, adding heat to it, and it's then degrading the plastic a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So there's two things. One is the leaching. The other is the microplastics. And both of them we are consuming. So the leaching comes when we heat up plastic. Right. So either in the microwave, washing it in hot water, we dishwasher. And the, the um, a lot of people think, well, I don't heat my food in the microwave, so I should be fine. Uh, but it's not just when you have food in there. It's when you wash it with hot water, the plastic becomes more porous. So that when you do put food in it, it will leach. So think of a sponge and the pores in the sponge. It just as the pores get larger and larger, more of the chemicals can seep out. And now one of the good indicators is if you see stained food containers at home, we've all seen the tomato sauce uh, ring on the inside. Oh, and, they're the worst. Well, when you see the stain that is, you know, in the container, yeah. you know that um, the food has gone into it, which also means that chemicals have come out of it. Oh my gosh, it's just gross. So the first thing I would do is clean up the kitchen and pull out all of the stained, yeah. all the ones that have an odorous smell to them. So there's times where you say, well, I washed it, but why does it still smell like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the takeout that I put in there, you know, the last time it was in it. So when they smell, when they stain, when you see a lot of scratches or um, cuts in them, time to throw them away. Or use them for something that's not food related. So use them to store your nails or 
you know, something else. Like nuts and bolts related. or right. something in the garage or, yeah. Right. Brilliant. Use them for another purpose. Okay, so I know that you also created um, straws, so stainless yes. steel straws, so that yes. we can get away right. from how many straws are we using? What's the number there? So um, I don't know the exact number of straws, yeah. but what I will say is that we have now gone to this, this idea that if you just switch over to a reusable straw, that you're fine. But the problem there is some of the reusable straws now contain different types of paint and some of the paints can contain lead and some of the some of them have aluminum, some of them gloss. So it's not just about using reusable. Let's use materials that are clean too that we know have been used for years and years and years. If you look at most kitchens, um, sort of restaurant uh, kitchens or hospital rooms, they're using stainless steel. Always. And they're using, you know, if you look at dental instruments or you're looking surgical tools, surgical table, why is it that they're using stainless steel? And a clean stainless steel mm -hmm. without paint, without, uh, you know, resins and things on it, it's because it's naturally antibacterial. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the simple. We can still make them beautiful. We can still have them in our home and not create as much garbage, but not at the expense of our health. I think that's just the key, right? You were telling me before we went on air, they spray the insides of um, aluminum cans. Like, right. I think we think it's just aluminum, but they also have plastic now. Right. right. So I don't want to scare people because that's the other thing, too, is that I don't want people to say, oh, my goodness, we, we've, we've so many chemicals. So the first thing is we all have chemicals in us because it is everywhere. Um, but are there things that we can do to decrease? 100% there are things that we can do. So one, as I mentioned, in the, in the kitchen to decrease the amount of times that you have heat and plastic together. Mm -hmm. So even mixing spoons, all that sort of stuff. So stainless steel utensils, spatulas, um, right. even soup wooden, ladles, yeah, wood. All of that, yeah. but get away from the plastic. Yep. The other is, um, so if you're going to a fast food takeout and you're looking at paper cups and you think, oh, well, it's paper, it's recyclable. Actually, that has a resin on the inside so that your paper cup won't disintegrate. That resin um, deteriorates and that resin contains BPA. So we actually end up consuming BPA with hot drinks. So we go to Starbucks, McDonald's, wherever it is that we're getting a hot coffee mm -hmm. and they're pouring it in. Mm -hmm. We think it's a paper cup. It's got plastic inside. Right. And then we're drinking. Right. And then if you BPA. look at uh, the lids, we're also looking at the lids. We're drinking out of plastic now. So now as we take a sip of our hot coffee, we're now having heat come through plastic and drink it. And what do we put in there as a stopper? It's plastic. And that's going into a hot coffee. So my suggestion here is... Um, because BPA is cumulative, that every little bit counts. So the one bit of it in the granola bar is not going to kill you. Um, but if you look at throughout your day, how much are you doing and where can you reduce? So if I'm going to go and I say I would really like a coffee, I'm going to go get one, drink it here, mm -hmm. and so that you're not consuming as much here. Mm -hmm. When you have this plot, take it out right away or use paper, or the, the wooden one, sorry. I've mm -hmm. seen the wooden ones too. Mm -hmm. I've even seen some people use a little piece of paper and sort of tuck it in as well. Yeah. So just any time you have the opportunity to remove plastic from heat, that would be my first um, thing. Especially when you look at the science, the science shows that with heat, BPA leaches 55 times faster. Wow. So if you can do that one thing is a big change. That one thing is a big change. I wish we could keep going with more changes, but here's what we know. No heat with plastic and eliminating as many sources of plastic as we possibly can. Right. Thank you so much for being here. You are amazing. Your company, Dalsini Stainless, is changing lives and changing the world. Thank you. When we come back, I'll share my final thoughts. Back in a moment. An inconvenient truth by former Vice President Al Gore feels like a long time ago, and in a way it was. Gore shared his research with us back in 2006, linking po pollution to climate change. You'd think that after over a decade of being woken up, we'd be well on our way to improving the health of our planet. But unfortunately, that isn't the case. Every day we hear something scary about climate change. 
the ice caps are melting, animals are becoming extinct, our oceans are heating up, and the inconvenient truth of it all is that in order to create real change, we each have a responsibility to clean up our act. We simply must change the way we live our lives if we want to preserve the health of our planet. While I'm hopeful for the future, there seems to be a lot of noise and finger pointing around whose problem it is. We need to stay mindful that we all play an important role in our ecosystem. It's a reciprocal relationship, even though it has started to feel really one-sided. Mother Earth has had to pick up the tab when it comes to keeping this planet hospitable, but she isn't going to put up with it much longer. We need to wake up and take waste seriously. How much we create, the types we create, and how we dispose of it. Thank you to Duncan Berry and Nicole hoover Bianash for helping us understand the crisis better and showing us where we can improve. And to Nita Tandon for being an innovator and a champion for a healthier, less plastic-ridden future. Until next time, I want you to remember one thing, that no matter where you are and no matter how it feels, you are never, ever alone. See you next time.